Λοιπόν, να, να ενημερώσω καταρχάς τον κύριο Ρος. Uh, dear colleague, uh, I inform you that uh, we start at last. <laughs> Thank you for your... Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. You've got the floor. I just thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a risk. So just to share my screen, I think this one, uh, and to uh, to go on PPT. Give me okay. just some time to present you to to the okay. to our okay. audience. Thank you. Καλημέρα λοιπόν σε όλους και όλες στη δεύτερη συνεδρία του 14ου ε, Συνεδρίου Ελληνική Γλώσσα και Ορολογία. Ζητάμε συγγνώμη για αυτή τη μικρή καθυστέρηση που φιλόταν σε τεχνικούς ρόλους που αφορούν τη διερμηνεία. Ενημερώνουμε ότι θα υπάρξει μαγνητοσκόπηση και διερμηνεία σε κάποιες από τις ομιλίες. Ε, παρακαλούνται επίσης οι ομιλητές να ομιλούν όσο πιο αργά μπορούν και να τηρήσουν και τον προβλεπόμενο χρόνο ομιλίας τους. We inform you that the conference will be recorded. We kindly ask speakers not to speak too fast or exceed the scheduled duration of their speech. Η πρώτη μας ομιλία έχει τον τίτλο Ontology for Terminology, A Passport to the Digital World. Θα την εκφωνήσει ο προσκεκλημένος ομιλητής μας, Christophe Roche, ο οποίος είναι ομότιμος καθηγητής τεχνητής νοημοσύνης στο Πανεπιστήμιο Savoie Mont Blanc της Γαλλίας και διευθυντής της ερευνητικής ομάδας Ondiak, Terminology and Ontology, ε, από το ίδιο πανεπιστήμιο. Τα ερευνητικά του ενδιαφέροντα εστιάζονται στους τομείς της τεχνητής νοημοσύνης, της γλωσσολογίας, των ψηφιακών ανθρωπιστικών επιστημών, της αναπαράστασης της γνώσης, της ορολογίας, της οντολογίας και της οντορολογίας. Είναι πρόεδρος των συνεδρίων ορολογίας και οντολογίας TOT Conferences, που πραγματοποιούνται από το 2007 στο Πανεπιστήμιο Savoie Mont Blanc και πρόεδρος της Επιτροπής Ορολογίας του Γαλλικού Οργανισμού Τυποποίησης, του ΑΦΝΟΡ, ε, από το 2014. Έχει συνεργαστεί με διακεκριμένα πανεπιστήμια της Κίνας και της Πορτογαλίας. Από το τρέχον έτος είναι επικεφαλής των δραστηριοτήτων του Κέντρου Αριστείας Τάλος του Πανεπιστημίου Κρήτης, ε, ως κάτοχος έδρας ERA, ERA Chairs Horizon. Ε, προγράμματα Horizon, στον τομέα της τεχνητής νοημοσύνης λοιπόν και των ψηφιακών ανθρωπιστικών επιστημών. Ε, ο λόγος σε σας κύριε Ρος, uh, please, uh, dear colleague. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And uh, guess us, hi to all. I'm very happy to, to hear, even online, and also to share my, um, my point of view about uh, ontology for terminology. Uh, well, the contents, uh, I will start uh, uh, with a few words about IT applications, uh, which, in my point of view, uh, quite well illustrate uh, the interest of a computational representation of the conceptual system of terminology. After that, uh, I will recall uh, some definitions uh, indeed, I'm not sure that we share the same definition of what terminology is. Uh, then, a few, uh, few words about the ISO theory of concept. And since we are interested in uh, uh, computer applications of uh, terminology, uh, the theory of concept in knowledge engineering, which uh, we called uh, ontology. After that, two, uh, two issues. Uh, we see if it's possible uh, to uh, translate ISO principles uh, into knowledge engineering. <clears throat> and this point uh, will be illustrated <clears throat> with a protege, the most famous environment for building ontologies. And uh, we see that it's not so easy. In fact, protege is very powerful, very interesting environment for building ontologies, but not so interesting for building terminologies. Uh, the reason why we conclude with the presentation of uh, an environment which implements ISO principles, more or less uh, ISO pr principles. We see that it's, uh, it will be necessary to uh, update some, uh, some of uh, these principles. Well, so uh, there are, a lot of IT applications 
uh, which will rely on uh, an operationalization of terminology. Let us quote semantic multi multilingual search engines, content management systems, specialized encyclopedias, knowledge capitalization, and of course, semantic web. And all this uh, application uh, rely uh, on a computational representation of the conceptual system. I mean that not only working on terms, words, let us say, lexical units, specialized lexical units, and uh, some linguistic relationships between these terms, but mainly uh, on a, a computational representation of concepts, what we call in knowledge engineering uh, an ontology. So the, uh, just to illustrate um, an application uh, of ontology for uh, terminology is this content management system and semantic search engine. Uh, it's uh, drawn from uh, a Uprint project, industrial uh, Uprint project. The main goal uh, was to uh, share technical documents between uh, 10 European countries about, uh, uh, about uh, solar energy and uh, mainly solar energy, renewable uh, energy. And uh, uh, it was not possible to translate all, all these uh, documents because it's too time consuming and of course too expensive. So the idea was to, um, uh, to classify or to index uh, these documents, not on keywords, but mainly on ideas, concepts in this case. And, uh, uh, and since the conceptualization uh, is more or less uh, language independent, uh, to use this, uh, this uh, common conceptualization, uh, both for finding uh, the most suitable uh, documents and also for classifying them. Let us take in this example in uh, uh, the left part, it's a visualization, uh, graphical visualization of the ontology uh, with concept names. We see later that concept names and terms are not really the same. And you can query in this case, uh, I'm looking for on ideas, not on terms. My query is in French uh, and the system is able to, uh, to get back uh, all the more relevant documents, whatever the model language. And you can see that the first uh, ones are all in English. Uh, and uh, you can also uh, note that the system is able to improve the relevance of, of the uh, search engine uh, based not on linguistic relationships, but on conceptual, on the logical properties of the conceptual system. Well, the main idea uh, behind uh, this, uh, this talk is to say that the explicit representation of concepts. What does it mean? Explicit representation of concepts. We'll see that. Uh, strongly impacts technology in its principles and methodology. Well, it's what is called the, the ontological turn of terminology. There was a linguistic turn of terminology. You are going to, to tell me that terminology is mainly a part or a sub-discipline of linguistics, but we can discuss about that. So uh, it's an ontological turn of terminology. Before uh, going on, just to, to recall some, some definition to be clear. Okay, about uh, terminology, I, I get that everybody here uh, will agree on uh, these uh, definitions, uh, which are very general. Terminology is both the science and the result of applying this science uh, to a specific domain. So it's a science studying term, term formation, term definition, in relation to a domain knowledge. It's also the result uh, of, uh, uh, of the science applied to a specialized domain. It's a set of terms, also uh, called specialized lexical units. Uh, knowing that a specialized lexical unit is a lexical unit which designates a specialized knowledge. So 
I think it's no problem. Of course, it means that we have also to agree uh, on what a term is, let's just say verbal designation of a concept. I think it's okay for this one too. And about the concept, uh, let us uh, keep the, uh, at this time quite general, is a unit of knowledge. Okay, uh, it, it, of course it's not enough. A unit of knowledge is too general. We have to precise uh, more exactly what the concept is. Uh, nevertheless, it, it's not because we can agree on, on these definitions. Uh, we can agree on the different approaches. As a matter of fact, uh, there are different approaches uh, depending uh, on uh, what you focus, you put your, your focus, your stress, either on terms or uh, on concepts. Uh, just to, to um, this point is, is important because it can explain why some, some a disagreement be between terminologies. As a matter of fact, there are different needs, different objectives, problems, and so which uh, require uh, different approaches and which can uh, lead to different results. Let us take two very different uh, applications. Uh, I guess that uh, most of you are translators. And uh, for her uh, team, uh, is every specialized physical unit a term or not? I, I don't mind. Uh, uh, since we have to translate these specialized physical units, we can consider the, the art term. Uh, is a designated knowledge a concept? It really depends on uh, how you are going to, to define a, a concept. But on the opposite, on the uh, other hand, uh, from an engineer point of view, uh, she or he most interesting in an explicit representation of the conceptual system, rather than how you speak about uh, this, uh, this knowledge. So it's mainly interesting not in natural language, but in formal lang languages. It means artificial languages uh, sp specialized to a specific domain. And they are also interesting in denomination of concepts. And ter terms and denomination of concepts are not the, not the same. The most important, of course, is to choose the approach that fits your, your, your needs. Um, I would like also to, uh, to, to stress uh, on the double dimension of terminology. If you agree that a term is a verbal designation of a concept, I think, yes, you can agree on that. It's taken from the previous uh, 1087 ISO standard. And uh, to illustrate these uh, double dimensions, I like this uh, uh, example taken from the Vessels machine tool, be a lingual dictionary. I like this one, uh, mainly because uh, if you uh, ask a linguist uh, about the technical drawings, Probably she or he uh, will say uh, that these technical drawings are illustrations of the definition of the terms. Whereas if you ask uh, an engineer, a mechanist in this case, he will say, well, uh, the text part is an explanation of the knowledge is. As a matter of fact, uh, if you give this, uh, this dictionary, to let us say a Chinese uh, Chinese person uh, who can't read a, 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 neither English nor French, it's not a problem. He can understand the, the meaning of, of, of these uh, drawings. So uh, we can say, say oh, well, yes, let, let us say that there is no problem for terms. Terms like Bush, like in Bush, okay, et cetera. And about uh, the text uh, uh, after this, okay, uh, systems, uh, there is so uh, definition or explanation, we have to decide, of the co concept. So an explanation in natural language of the concept designated by the terms. We, we can say it's a definition, uh, I don't mind. And about uh, this, uh, uh, this technical drawing, 
for the engineer, uh, it's a concept, it's a concept itself. And what is uh, important is to, uh, to bear in mind that this uh, technical drawing is really a definition of the concept in a uh, formal la language. Um, so two kinds uh, of, uh, of definition. And uh, uh, just to, uh, to note that uh, the second one, perhaps quite new, but um, quite new about uh, for you, about the formal uh, definitions. It's uh, also what uh, uh, we call uh, a constructive definition, uh, unlike a definition natural language. By constructive definition, we mean that uh, it's a means to really create, to create entities which can be calculated and manipulated. This point is very, very important. So now uh, I would like also to, uh, uh, to stress on three hypotheses uh, and it's important to, uh, to agree or, or disagree. Uh, if you disagree uh, on these three hypotheses, uh, you can leave and to have a coffee because all my talk is based on these three hypotheses. The first one, I think this is not a problem for you. A term is a designation of a concept. Uh, you can note that uh, I use different colors, blue for the linguistic dimension and green for the conceptual one. And there is between these uh, two entities, a relationship, designation in weight. Well, uh, so the first one uh, belongs to linguistics, okay? And let us say, I'm not going to, to read this term because it's a term, ethy because it's too long, acid, this is kind of acid. Uh, and uh, this, term, uh, this term, I'm not sure that you can uh, see my, can, can you see my pointer or not? No. Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. 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 Great, great. Yes. So here is a term, system designates, okay, uh, this, uh, this uh, symbol. Um, just also, I, I'm also with, uh, say a few words uh, about it later, but it's important here to, to bear in mind that a term uh, is given. You can extract terms from texts, from discourses, okay. Whereas, Concept names are built. Concept names are built in such a way by reading them, you can understand the object, the nature of the object subsumed by the concept. It's very, very important. And uh, the, the main goal of modern language is, is to write sounds. Whereas the main goal of formal la languages is to write ideas. And uh, if you see this, Topological, uh, topological representation of a concept is not possible to read it. You can only comment it, you can't read it, okay? This one is very interesting because it's richer than this one, okay. The second uh, hypothesis is very important. Perhaps uh, you can disagree on this one. Um, a concept is extra linguistic. You can disagree on it. Uh, if you are a pure linguist, you can consider that the concept is a kind of signified uh, according to the sources point uh, approach. And you can say that the concept is a kind of signified and be, uh, belongs also to linguistics. But for my talk, a concept is extra linguistics, especially when, uh, if you agree on that also, uh, that the relationships between concepts are different from the relationships between terms, but here too, you can accept it. Let, let us say, Yes, okay. Uh, and uh, so in this case, first uh, consequence is to, uh, to see that there are uh, two different semiotic systems uh, and they, they don't match. Uh, of course, there are some relationships between the two semiotic systems, but they don't match. Uh, it means also that term and terms and concept names are different. 
since they belong to two different symmetric systems. And as a matter of fact, there are no concepts index. L linguistic clues, but no, no concepts. Okay. Let us say that you are agree also on this first conclusion based on the two first hypotheses. The last uh, uh, hypothesis is about definition. What a definition is. Since uh, all of you are terminologists and also linguists, uh, I'm sure that you have, well, of course, uh, a definition or several definitions about what a definition is. Uh, in this case, I'm interested in finding out the, the most elementary definition of definition. I mean, the definition of definition which is applicable, which is valid, whatever the semantic system, either natural or formal, okay? So, at, as really as a basement foundation, uh, a definition is an operation that puts in equivalence a sign, the left part, definium, or defined, if, with a well formed formula of signs called definiens. Definiendums uh, in equivalence with the definite, uh, with the definiens. Okay. Okay. So, uh, since it's an equivalence operator, you can substitute the definiendum by the definience. And if your semiotic system has a semantics, this substitution is salva veritate. The truth is, uh, is kept. But also it means that the definiendum and the definience belong to the same semiotic system. Is it okay for everybody? Okay? Yes, yeah. so fine, great. What does it mean? If the definiendum and definience belong to the same semiotic system, and since concept is extra linguistic, like extra linguistic, so therefore a concept cannot be defined in natural language. Cannot be defined in natural language. And if you want something in natural language, is an explanation in natural language what a concept is, and what a concept, uh, I don't see, okay, what a concept is, and it's not a definition of the concept, okay? Just to stress on this point, we can say that there are two types of definition. A lexicographic definition, also called definition of word, and to quote Alain Ray, uh, I, I, I liked uh, uh, Alain Ray, uh, he, he, he wrote very, very interesting, in my point of view, very interesting, uh, especially uh, in the uh, que sais -je, uh, terminology and notion. It's a famous uh, Kusej book, a small book, but very interesting. Well, uh, so to quote uh, him, as for the lexicographical definition, it concerns only the signs of a language. It explains meanings while trying to distinguish not concepts and classes of things, but meanings and classes of use of signs. Very clear. On the opposite, or on the other, other hand, uh, there is a terminological definition, also called definition of thing, from Aristotle's ontological definition. It's very important. In this case, we put the stress on epistemology. To the constructive definition of mathematics, constructive is a very important word. It means that we are able to, to create uh, really, uh, entities. We remain on the same ground. We do not define words, but terms organized into structured systems and reflecting a conceptual, formal, consistent, consistent is very important, 
organization, whether or not it's considered as reflecting the various structures of being. Okay. And of course, uh, there are relationships between these two, two definitions. And this point is very important because if we clearly distinguish uh, these two dimensions, and uh, if we clearly uh, uh, define concept with a dedicated uh, formal language, formal or let us say artificial language. And then it, it's, um, it's also a means to transfer some good properties from formal system to a system natural language. There are, of course, some relationships between concept definition and term definition. Let, let us just say a few words about this slide. So a term, yeah, so two di dimensions, linguistic and extra linguistic. The term is a verbal designation of a concept. A concept belong to a, a formal uh, semantic system and uh, will be defined uh, using uh, a specific language as a mathematics, uh, chemistry, uh, and so on. And this uh, representation of the concept can be uh, translated or explained uh, in natural language. And in this case, this expression of the descriptive statement in natural language is a definition of things, definition of term. So it means that in this case, we are not interested in meanings built in discourses. We are not interested in meaning built in discourses, the, the, the uh, signified. Well, only interesting in meaning, if you can say that concept is a kind of meaning, uh, uh, out of any discourses. Well, so to go on, we have to precise what a concept is, what is a concept. And uh, if uh, there are different types or different theories of concept, of course there are. Are they equivalent? Unfortunately not. Uh, unfortunately not. And uh, uh, since there is no knowledge without any language, and in this case, formal language, uh, we need a specific uh, language to represent, define the concept. So we have to choose in which language. Are they uh, different languages? Of course they are. Uh, are they uh, equivalent? Unfortunately, and of course, they are not. And uh, also, the last question is about uh, existing environments. Uh, these language uh, languages were mainly interesting uh, in computer readable language, and what uh, what is called uh, an ontology. Well, about concept in ISO and knowledge engineering. So, what a concept is? We have no time to to open uh, discussions uh, about concept, perhaps, perhaps after the talk. But A2, we can say very roughly that a concept is a unit of knowledge about a plurality of things. Uh, whose main goal is a uh, boss or either, A2, it depends on your approach, to organize the objects which populate the world. There are a lot of, of the objects, this mess of objects, and uh, we want to organize, uh, to organize them. And also uh, a concept uh, aims to understand the nature of, uh, of objects. It depends. Uh, some people uh, think that it's not uh, mandatory. So we can say that a concept aims two goals, understanding the world and or, and or organizing the object. Uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, you can organize uh, objects which populate the world without understanding their nature. For example, to gather objects, they find the same property, same color, same shape, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas if you understand the nature of objects, is uh, you can organize them, of course. So the results uh, will be 
sets uh, of these objects, let us say, they find the same property. And of course, this set uh, can overlap. OK, now, what is the point of view of ISO about concept? First of all, it's important to bear in mind that uh, the ISO standards uh, about terminology uh, as ISO de de defines terminology, uh, it means for the two core standards, the 1087 and the 704. Uh, from ISO, uh, terminology is mainly for human communication in natural language. Human communication in natural language is mainly for communication between humans. It's not for computer science. Of course, you can use uh, uh, these principles or ISO principles for building conceptual system, but these documents, 704, but the same idea for 1087, that, uh, they don't cover uh, computer science. But ISO, uh, the standards are very, very interesting when, when you want to, uh, to build a conceptual system. And uh, uh, we need these standards for, uh, for building the conceptual system of ter terminology. Unfortunately, and if you are interested in computer science, unfortunately, uh, these principles are uh, raise some issues. Uh, as some uh, ISO standards, uh, not uh, not this. Uh, just to quote the 10, uh, the 1828 about health informatics. Um, uh, as soon as you want to apply uh, or to use these standards for IT applications, you uh, you will uh, we have to tackle with some problems. Just to quote uh, 1828. Uh, it's about computer science, about informatics, uh, IT applications in, uh, in health. Uh, it's interesting because uh, trying to, uh, to implement these principles highlight that uh, there are some problems and there is, there is still a urgent need to review uh, ISO 704 and 1087 mainly in order to clarify the relationships, relationships, relations between concept, generic concept, specific concept, object, oh, by the way, object, there are no objects in 1087. Class, there are no class. Instance, there are no instance. Designation and formal, formal representation. So uh, there is a problem, or there are problems that we are going to, to see. And ju just, just to recall uh, these principles from so 1087 and 704, a concept is a unit of knowledge, a unit of knowledge created by a unique combination of characteristics. Uh, and uh, from this uh, start point, uh, ISO distinguishes two uh, kinds of concept, individual concept. There is no object, individual concept. If you want to take it to account the notion of object, you have to create an individual concept, concept that corresponds to a unit object and general concept. So the previous version of, uh, of 1087 was quite interesting because if you remember, uh, not the last version, but the previous one, uh, general concept, a general concept was defined as a concept that corresponds to two or more, two or more. But what about concept uh, whose extension is empty, who correspond to nothing? So is the reason why uh, we have decided to, to add a potentially unlimited number, etc. Potentially is a word which should not appear in the definition, mainly because Everybody can interpret it differently, so it's not it, it's not satisfying. As a matter of fact, uh, this definition you, you can understand that easily to uh, to be understood. It's not a problem. So problem um, comes from that these definitions are inconsistent 
from a logical and epistemological point of view. It's a main problem. As a matter of fact, uh, if you want to represent, let's just say a proper name or what a proper name represents, you have to create an individual concept whose extension is reduced to only one object, the object itself. So it's, it's, it's too complicated. And uh, when about seven or four, it's written that the characteristics that make up a concept can themselves be concepts. But in this case, what are the characteristics which define a characteristic considered as a concept? It's not consistent. And um, the main problem comes from natural language. Natural language is a trap. Um, I'm not, I think I will not have time to explain why formal language are, are interesting. Uh, in, in saying that characteristics can, uh, can then say be concept, um, natural language is not, um, cannot distinguish between two, the, between different categories of thought. So let, let us see if we can read, I guess you can read, it's not so complicated. If I decide to, uh, to write concepts, starting with a uppercase and writing them between bracket angles, uh, in this case, the concept mortal is defined as a combination of one, only one essential characteristic, which is mortal. Essential characteristic uh, can be written between two slashes. So in this case, it's correct, but you can say that characteristic that make up a concept as themselves a concept is not co consistent from a logical point of view. Well, about concept relationships. Concept uh, relations are only relations between concepts. And uh, here too, there are some problems. There are two kinds of hierarchical relations, either generic or partitive. And associative uh, relationships, that the last version of 1087, we have uh, introduced um, a lot of different uh, associative relationships. Okay. But here too, uh, say that I, I can understand uh, that. For some people, a partitive relationship is a hierarchical relationship, but it's not of the same nature as the generic one, uh, especially because a partitive relationship is not a relationship between concepts. It's a relationship between objects specified at a conceptual level. It's the same thing for associative relations. And in order to clearly distinguish them, it's necessary to clearly specify relations in terms of domain and range. So using a more formal relationship for, relation, for relationships is a very interesting and useful means. And to clearly distinguish uh, which are the entities uh, linked to uh, the different relationships. For example, generic relationship is between concept to concept to concept. Instance relationship is between an object to a concept and partitive as well as associative relationships are between objects but specified at a conceptual level. Okay but no time to, to go further. What about now the theory of concept in knowledge engineering, uh, what we call an ontology? On ontology, uh, ontologies, I, I like to quote, uh, okay, just a point, okay. Uh, I like to quote uh, this uh, practical guide because it's especially if you are interested in a protege. Ontologies are used to capture knowledge about some domain of interest. I fully agree. An ontology describes the concepts in the domain and also the relationships that hold between those concepts. Completely agree. Different ontology languages provide different facilities. That's the last point is also very important. Okay. Just to quote, uh, just to quote, uh, an example taken from medicine, a bio portal, uh, it is a hierarchy of, in this case, classes. It's not a concept, it's a class. Uh, and we say few words about that. As a matter of fact, uh, a class is not a concept, a concept is not a class. Uh, during the discussion, if you have time, you can say few words about that. And so, uh, in the uh, left part, the hierarchy of classes. Uh, and uh, for example, in this case, in the selected class, 
you can read the preferred name, some synonyms, etc., and you can visualize uh, the hierarchy of, of, of classes. Just to sum up, uh, a definition I, uh, I, I gave uh, uh, more than 20 years ago. An ontology is a shared description of concepts and the relationships of a domain expressed in a formal and computer readable language. It's a definition of ontology is uh, computer science in, in AI, in artificial intelligence. Well, now, few words about the notion of, of class. Uh, so it's more or less equivalent of concept in ISO. In AI, the main goal so, is to organize the object, okay, which populates the world, you completely agree, into classes, into classes, not under concept, into classes, according to the relationships that linked object together. This point is very, very important. What does it mean? It means that uh, an object is not defined by, by its nature, for example, by its essential characteristics. By the way, we never defined uh, an object. We define a concept, we, you describe an object, but let us say that just too short, to shorten. An object is not defined more exactly described by its nature, but by its relationships with other objects. This point is very, very important because it means to, uh, to change your way of thinking, to change your way of, of seeing the world. For example, if you want, want to define what a share is, what is a share? You have to think your object, a share, particular share or share in general, you have to, to think, it, think it as a set of elements connected to each other. So let us take a hammer and break down your share into parts. What you can do? So in this case, it's not so difficult, perhaps not so natural, but it's not so difficult to, uh, to say, well, a share is what? It is an object, what you also call indiv individual in this case, but when we speak about individual in, a, in computer science, it's not a person, of course. It means something which can be not divided into parts. So uh, a share is an individual connected to four fits, to four individuals, fits for the has part relationships, and also with the same relationship has part to a bag, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So oh, no, so complicated. Now, let us see how we can uh, translate the ISO principles into knowledge engineering. So just re recall that the concept, unique combination of characteristics, essential characteristics, the characteristic of a concept, which is in this, in, in indispensable to understand, the characteristic is abstraction of a property, property is a feature of an object, etc. Is anything perceivable or conceivable? Okay, now let us see how we can translate the, the ISO principles in, uh, in AI, knowledge engineering. And for doing that, uh, I will illustrate uh, this point using Protege. Protege. Protege is a free environment, free software, open software, open source software. Uh, written in Java, uh, developed at Stanford University. There's a very, the, uh, there's a very big, big uh, community. Uh, it's a very interesting environment, uh, which uh, proposes a lot of features, very interesting of features uh, in, in, the, in the system. You can define classes, not concept classes, relationships, uh, also a kind of a linguistic, linguistic uh, dimensions. You can export uh, yeah, your ontology or let us say your knowledge graph uh, very easily uh, in order to share your terminology, your onto terminology. Hey, our colleague, uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, just yes. for, for, for matters of time, uh, uh, please uh, be somewhat brief if you can. Thank you very much. Oh, to brief. Okay. Uh, yes, I. Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, so let, let us take the example of uh, uh, from uh, uh, great vases, ancient great vases about craters. 
And uh, if, to find out uh, the essential characteristics, either from definition or by looking at the object, is not so complicated. You uh, can note that column crater is named uh, uh, for its column-like handles, same thing for volutes. You can also note uh, that uh, there are some uh, distinguished characteristics uh, about the handles. They can share also some characteristics. OK, so uh, th this is a representation of uh, uh, an ontology. Uh, in blue, the linguistic dimension, and is green, the, uh, the conceptual one, using a formal language. Uh, by formal language, you can see my pointer is a linear language for defining concepts, uh, and in blue uh, is translation. And uh, characteristics uh, are written between the slashes, and uh, from a, a, a species and the genus, uh, there is a specific difference. Okay. So to, uh, to build, uh, to use Protege to implement classes is also complicated. You can also simply click on this, for example, on this icon, in order to define subclasses and subclasses, etc. But if you do that, uh, you are not really defined north. Uh, if you want, you want to define only bell crater in, term, in terms of essential characteristics, uh, that is one, for example, uh, you have to express um, this essential characteristic. Unfortunately, uh, it's difficult to do it directly. Uh, we have to use uh, what is called uh, object property restrictions. It means how to use relationships between uh, parts to, to define what a bell crater is. And you can uh, note that you can read, it's not so complicated that a bell crater has exactly two upward curling uh, handle. And uh, it's more complicated if you want to say that this kind of crater has no neck. So no neck is not a part, of course. You have to write a logical form formula. This one not has parts on neck. But uh, what about this kind of, uh, of knowledge of essential characteristics for storing a transport, for one, uh, for mixing wine and water? There are no, no parts of your object, so it is more difficult. Uh, nevertheless, you can create uh, artificial individuals to express this but it becomes very, very, very complicated for, for doing that. And even in this case, it's very uh, complicated to, to uh, find out or to ask to your system to, uh, to say what is the difference between a column crater and a bell crater. Okay, so uh, I skip this one uh, about the linguistic dimension. If you want to really express the linguistic dimension in your system, so uh, it's too complicated. Well, uh, so, uh, protege or translating uh, directly ISO uh, into, uh, an, into AI is, uh, is complicated mainly due to uh, the AI uh, system because uh, the notion of class does not exist, the notion of essential characteristic uh, does not uh, exist never. So it's really uh, a problem and perhaps the most important the experts have uh, to change their way of thinking and not very, very poor linguistic dimensions. Um, what about the, the, uh, the inverse, the opposite to poor uh, Is it possible to implement the ISO principles in a specific environment? Yes, it's possible, but for doing that, we have to correct, because it's really you have to correct some ISO uh, principles. And the first one is to reintroduce the notion of object. We need object. Individual concept, is unfortunately a very, okay. We have to delete it. Uh, many for logical, for logical uh, uh, principles, but also from an epistemological point of view. You have to go back to more classical uh, theory of knowledge and of course to take into account logic. And the same thing about the conceptual relationship. You have to clearly distinguish the different types of relationships according to their, what is called their domain and the range. Okay, so uh, just very quickly about uh, search and implementation. It's an environment, mode, environment called Teddy, based on the notion of ontoterminology. It means terminology whose conceptual system is a formal ontology. 
And the main idea is not to standardize natural language because it's not possible to standardize natural language, but to standardize, standardize only what can be standardized. Uh, it means knowledge and to preserve uh, what must be preserved, namely linguistic diversity. So uh, the system uses uh, linear language, formal language, and the very fine logical properties. So it's also complicated. The environment uh, uh, offers uh, several uh, dedicated editors for the conceptual dimension, the so object dimension, for uh, characteristics, different editors about essential characteristics, relation and attributes, the notion of att uh, attribute unfortunately does not exist in 1087, and the same things about the language dimension about term editor and proper name editor. So just to, uh, uh, to see what a concept editor looks like. So in this case, for example, uh, it's possible to, of course, to display the, the hierarchy based on the sub concept relationship. You can see uh, the inherited essential characteristics and also the uh, specific essential characteristics. Uh, the system check, uh, check, check at every step the consistency of your system, about relationships, formal definitions. And uh, also you can link the, 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 the concepts to external resources about term editor. Uh, uh, is, is also a hierarchy based on a, uh, on a, hyper, on a terminology called hypernymy. It's not a linguistic hyponym, it's different. Terminological hyponym. And you can uh, note that the system is able to calculate automatically the equivalent terms and, of course, hypernyms, synonyms, etc. Uh, okay, hypernym. Ah, by the way, uh, this point is also important. The system is able to uh, automatically uh, generate uh, a pattern of definition in natural language from the formal definition uh, of the concept. In this case, for example, so uh, in TD, the bell quarter designates um, a concept whose name is automatically created by the system. And from the formal definition, the system generates this definition in natural language and the expert can edit it for uh, stylistic, uh, for stylistic. Well, uh, here for proper name and uh, object names and some. Okay, so uh, just uh, to conclude about uh, TD, the system is able, of course, to export uh, in different formats. For example, in electric, electro, uh, electric, electronic dictionary. In this case, the blue uh, dimension, linguistic in blue, in green, uh, conceptual dimension, and in gray, uh, the object dimensions. We can also export in RDF as a matter of fact, probably or, or, uh, it's also your case we are asked more and more to produce our terminology in RDF, in a computer readable uh, format, not on, only in Excel, it's not enough, of course, and uh, you can generate from TD RDF graph which in order to upload uh, and protege or to directly query them using Sparkle, the dedicated language, query language for knowledge graph. Well, so to conclude, the explicit representation of concepts strongly in part and also clarify, you saw it, uh, the terminology in its principles and methodology. Ontology term, the clear separation of semiotic system, terms are given, concept names are built, definition of term, them are definition of think, whereas definition of concept are formal definition of your concept. And so the last, the last slide, uh, if you want to, uh, to sum up uh, ISO principles and uh, uh, the computational approach of these principles using either protege in order to translate or TD in order to implement ISO principles. About concept theory, the ISO principles is based on essence, the essence of essential characteristics, whereas protege is based on descriptive, this notion of class. TD is the same approach as ISO. Uh, essence, computational uh, ISO, no, and it's not possible. Protege, of course, yes, TD, yes. Logical ISO, unfortunately, no. Protégé, yes, and TD, yes. And methodology, uh, ISO is 704. Protégé, there are a lot of do documents 
uh, about uh, about it, but uh, not implemented. Whereas in Teddy, uh, there is a term guided uh, approach which is implemented to help you to build your terminology in your consistent system. That's all, folks. It's done. Just to stop sharing my screen. So if you have any questions, please. Thank you very much, dear colleague, for your so insightful and interesting presentation. Uh, I think that uh, we have to, to transpose the, the, the questions uh, part for the, for, the, for the end of the session uh, due to time reasons. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Questions in the, at the end of the session, please. Not yes, now, I, because, I, because we okay, have no yeah. time. This is a, a matter of time. Yeah, yes, I understand. Thank, thank, thank you very thank much. You. Η επόμενη ομιλία έχει τίτλο The Population of a Maritime Heritage Thesaurus Based on a Greek Project Documentation Case. Uh, η επόμενη ομιλία ανήκει στις κυρίες Ελένη Γεωργάκη και Σοφία Στάμου. Η Ελένη Γεωργάκη είναι υποψήφια διδάκτορα στο Τμήμα Ναυτιλίας και Επιχειρηματικών Uh, υπηρεσιών του Πανεπιστημίου Αιγαίου και εκπονεί διδακτορική διατριβή με τίτλο Digital Visual Documentation and Communication of Greek Maritime Heritage στο πλαίσιο του ερευνητικού έργου ENIRIST. Έχει σπουδάσει φιλολογία στο ΕΚΠΑ και αρχαιονομία, βιβλιοθηκονομία και μουσιολογία στο Ιόνιο Πανεπιστήμιο. Ολοκλήρωσε τις μεταπτυχιακές σπουδές στα πληροφοριακά συστήματα στο Linnaeus University, Linnaeus University, στο Βέκχορ στη Σουηδία. Η Σοφία Στάμου είναι μόνιμη επίκουρη καθηγήτρια του Τμήματος Αρχαιονομίας, Βιβλιοθηκονομίας και Μουσιολογίας του Ιωνίου Πανεπιστημίου, στο γνωστικό αντικείμενο Βιβλιοθηκονομία, πρότυπα οργάνωσης και συστήματα γλωσσικής επεξεργασίας τεκμηρίων. Έχει σπουδές στη Φιλολογία, Πανεπιστήμιο Ιωαννίνων και μεταπτυχιακές και διδακτορικές σπουδές στο Τμήμα Μηχανικών Υπολογιστών και Πληροφορικής του Πανεπιστημίου Πατρών. Το επιστημονικό πεδίο ερευνάς της εστιάζει σε θέματα γλωσσολογικής ανάλυσης και επεξεργασίας Κειμένου, παρακαλώ. Καλημέρα σας. Ακούγουμε. Ακούγεστε, ακούγεστε μια χαρά. Ωραία. Ε, καλημέρα, ευχαριστώ πολύ για την τιμή να κάνω την παρουσίαση ε, εδώ σήμερα. Ε, so, good morning. My presentation is related to the creation of a thesaurus in the maritime heritage field a controlled vocabulary missing from the specific cultural heritage domain. The suggested vocabulary could improve methods for archiving oral, oral sources, written accounts, images, 3D archaeology, and multimedia objects related to people and periods from ancient times to recent history. It has been created to cover the intensing needs for resources from Greek maritime glam institutions hosted in a maritime heritage platform of the research infrastructure and IRIST. Its terms are derived from the collections which include objects and heirlooms, personal items, screenshots, archaeological items, shipping companies' archives, correspondence, periodicals, photographs from calling stations and lighthouses. Although the construction of this vocabulary took into consideration specific data and their documentation, the goal is to go beyond an iris, assist in future maritime heritage documentation projects, and add professionals and researchers in organizing maritime heritage data. The long-term ambition is to improve maritime heritage data communication in general and to contribute in the promotion of maritime heritage as a separate cultural heritage branch. Building the thesaurus was part of the process of the creation of the digital platform 
and an innovative element as there has been no precedent in the area of maritime heritage. It is comprised of terms derived from the collections which include scans of models and designs that are related to emblematic categ categories of ships historically, scans of navigation instruments and related items, other objects of maritime museums and organizations, and material related... Με συγχωρείτε, προχωράνε οι διαφάνειές σας. Δεν βλέπουμε τις διαφάνειές σας. Έχετε δίκιο, είναι σκόπου μου. Ε, το Α, ελέγχω. εντάξει. Ναι, ναι. Εντάξει, εντάξει. Ευχαριστώ. Παρακαλώ. Ε, the research is primarily focused on a practical design of a thesaurus which describes topical subjects visually represented in maritime heritage documents, photographs and artifacts, but also caters for the completion of other Dublin core fields in the cataloging process, such as the coverage and the type fields. It can be regarded as a cell and is definitely not a complete work since the addition of new digitized and interconnected items will lead to a subsequent expansion of the thesaurus and this process is estimated to be continuous. The procedure followed for the construction of a strictly controlled vocabulary was the use of a streamlined multi-tiered hierarchical arrangement and the placement of specific concepts within the hierarchical structure of terminology that function as key access points to maritime heritage collections. The basis of development of this project is the documentation of the digitalized cultural and archival material provided by Greek maritime institutions with the provided data falling into the previously mentioned data typology of the platform. Although the construction of the maritime heritage thesaurus took into consideration very specific data, the intention was not to establish a static country-specific vocabulary. A goal is with the adoption of this vocabulary to encourage reflection on how data are described and organized. Apart from accessibility for the researcher and the wider audience, it is also estimated that it will have immediate benefits to the cataloging staff of the maritime museums or related research projects in the future. As for the method, the procedure involved two stages. First, the monolingual thesaurus was produced and then the translation of the reduced thesaurus was carried out sometimes taking into account terms and subject headings already existing in the vocabularies of reference. The specifications of the corresponding ELOT, the background of standardization in Greece and ISO standards were followed, as well as the international developments in the matters of construction and management of the story, but also the Greek particularities in the issues of um, language and terminology. For instance, the National Library of Greek subject headings, as well as definitions from the Center for the Greek Language in order to guide the cataloger or the user in the note section of the thesaurus, were adopted or, seri or seriously taken into consideration. This work focuses on identifying the top-level concepts, facets, and the hierarchies that will become its common basis, meeting the demands for subjective and disciplinary validity, but also taking into consideration wider cultural heritage concepts. So, top-level concepts were developed by adequate abstraction from existing controlled vocabularies. The methodology followed required decisions to be made whether generic concepts subsume efficiently enough narrower terms from different visori and to determine whether concepts are co comprehensively enough defined in order to allow experts and catalogers to assign the metadata of, the, of their exhibits to them. Following this methodology, an initial set of top-level concepts was primarily designed based on other previously mentioned vocabularies, but also creating a first operational draft. Thesauri cooperation and terminology integration are highly intended to ensure reliability of the endeavor 
and ensuring that previous cataloging practice was integrated at least as far as the first experimental set of data is concerned. And when put in practice, new entries and finer ramifications may apply. Four facets, along with their hierarchies, top terms and narrower terms, have been defined thus far. The material at my disposal indicated the need for further distinction and specification. The hierarchies were extended by narrower terms of classification for addressing more specific classes of categorization according to the material's guidance. The updating and revising of the proposed classification and definitions is an ongoing process. There was no established or authorized way of cataloging from the institutions which provided the artifacts for digitization in order to compare or base the research. This was a challenge which was addressed through leveraging average for the construction of the thesaurus. The vocabulary developed is subject specific and based on the Getty Foundation's art and architecture thesaurus Wikipedia's DBpedia Semantic Thesaurus, the established National Library of Greece Terms, the Thesaurus of Graphic Materials of the Library of Congress and Library of Congress Subject Headings, excerpts from lists of thematic headings which are considered to contribute were also studied and adopted or adapted accordingly in some cases and terminology reported in literature was also incorporated. The current proposed version of the vocabulary was based to a large extent on the UNESCO thesaurus and its Greek adaptation through a bilingual vocabulary of thematic tags, which is complementary to the UNESCO thesaurus carried out by the National Documentation Center in Greece. The choice is not at all arbitrary, but it serves interoperability without sacrificing precision with regard to the particular thematic area. There were cases where a decision should be reached when multiple controlled vocabularies were consulted. Also, research in specific trade unions sources was conducted in order to effectively grasp the occupational activities and reach specific terminology and reaching related terms and describing holistically terms that should be described, for instance, the term metal industry. The same objective was intended when combining terms from other sources to build the terms closer to their thematic essence and building this maritime heritage controlled vocabulary based on a representative database of the field. Experts, catalogers from institutions included in the Enirist project, and not only them, have been asked to review hierarchies and comment on their structure, content, or translation. A questionnaire was sent for completion and was used as a measuring instrument. The questionnaire examined the competence of the introduction, reviewed compliance with the thesaurus building criteria as derived from a Doro literature review, and also examined particular terms, hierarchies, and facets of the first operational draft of the thesaurus, testing structure, content, translation, and related elements as appearing when the user browses the thesaurus online or the maritime heritage platform of the Enirist infrastructure, selecting to view the metadata of items included in its collection. The thesaurus is built up of descriptors and identifiers grouped into facets representing subdivisions of broad fields. As shown in the slide, its main term indicates broader terms, narrower terms, related terms, subject category, a historical note. It may also indicate scope note, non-preferred terms or synonyms, and linking between the non-preferred term to the preferred one. The previous mentioned indicators are also given in this slide in the Greek uh, language in accordance with their appearance in the thesaurus management system. Four facets and 11 hierarchies have been singled out 
as access points to maritime heritage collections and are placed in the first tier of the thesaurus to successfully narrow down the scope of searching. There are the following facets, concepts, material objects, activities, geopolitical units, and the top terms economy, science, culture, information and communication, item types, countries and country groupings. The orphans facet and the hierarchy include terms that have not yet been organized hierarchically. As regards the construction of the facets, the process of their building was inspired by the art and architecture thesaurus facet code and the backbone thesaurus, a meta thesaurus, which proposes a common model of thesaurus building. As mentioned, this thesaurus is designed to be used at the maritime heritage platform NAFCLIROS of the research infrastructure and IRIS, but definitely not limited. The typology of the objects includes objects and heirlooms that incorporate personal items provided by the Hellenic Maritime Museum, a collection of screenshots provided by the Hellenic Maritime Museum, the Lascaridis Foundation, the Maritime Museum of Nusses, a collection of archaeological items provided by the Maritime Museum of Nusses, archives of shipping companies provided by the uh, Piraeus Bank Group Cultural Foundation, personal and official correspondence, periodicals provided by the Naval History Service, photographic material from coaling stations and lighthouses provided by the photography archive of the municipality of Kea Island of Cyclades. The construction of the Maritime Heritage Thesaurus has been bottom-up, starting with more than one language simultaneously and non-symmetrical, since it is also possible not to have the same number of descriptors in each language. Single descriptors can be combined to express compound concepts, since post-coordination was followed. Nevertheless, pre-combinations such as adding qualifiers to provide clarity or handle translation issues have been applied. The thesaurus was implemented with the web thesaurus management system software supported by the Cultural Informatics Research Group of the Institute of Computer Science of the University of Crete. This system works in a graphical internet environment and provides for the construction and management of bilingual multi-thematic thesauri in this case, with Greek as the dominant language and English as the reference language. It follows the specification of the corresponding Kelot and ISO standards and the international de developments in the matters of construction and management of the story, but definitely also the Greek particularities in matters of language and terminology. For the terms search, quick search and search by selecting criteria is provided. Users have the ability to search for a term in general, as well as specifically by general field or combination of fields using logical operands. From the results screen, users can view the results, save them to a file or print them, or by clicking on a term, view that term's card. In the present application, alphabetical, hierarchical and graphical presentation of the source terms is possible. When viewing terms, users can also jump to one or more term positions at the hierarchies to which it belongs and return to the top of the page. In the alphabetical presentation, all data relating to a descriptor are displayed as well as cross references from non-descriptors to descriptors and details of the display data can be found in the legend. Με συγχωρείτε, έτσι σας υπενθυμίζω λίγο όσο πιο Ολοκληρώνω, ολοκληρώνω, ολοκληρώνω. In the hierarchical presentation, the position of a term in the hierarchy to which it belongs is shown. As mentioned, this presentation can also be saved and printed. The graphical presentation shows the entire 
three of, uh, of uh, hierarchy, including the terms and their position in the hierarchy. Different colors help to represent the relationships within it. The population of the thesaurus with terms from maritime legislation documents is currently designed and, and in progress. Uh, thank you a lot for your attention. Σας ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα παρουσίαση. Εγώ ευχαριστώ. Και να δούμε τώρα την επόμενη ομιλία μας. Η επόμενη ομιλία έχει τίτλο Translating Greece's Procedural Codes και είναι τον Daniel Weber και John O'Shea. Πρόκειται για δύο διακεκριμένους νομικούς μεταφραστές με πλούσιο μεταφραστικό και συγγραφικό μάλιστα ερευνητικό έργο έχουν μεταφράσει κώδικες δικονομίας από τα ελληνικά στα αγγλικά. Τους ακούμε με πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Καλημέρα. Δεν είναι αναμένο το βίντεο μου, δεν μπορώ να το ανάψω εγώ. Βλέπετε την παρουσίαση μου. Ναι, 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 φαίνεται ναι, κανονικά. Ναι. Ευχαριστώ πολύ τον κύριο Κρυμπά για την εισαγωγή. Ευχαριστούμε την Ελετό και την, για την πρόσκληση. Ε, θα μιλήσω στα αγγλικά. Uh, I will be presenting uh, in English uh, about the Greek procedural codes and the terminological issues that arose. Uh, our publishing house was founded in 2020 mm -hmm. by John O'Shea and myself for the purpose of translating and publishing Greek laws into English with a bilingual layout, with the Greek on uh, the left and the English on the right-hand side of each page. Our main task is to translate all Greek codes, civil code, uh, criminal code, correctional code, and so forth. And a subgroup of this task is to translate the procedural codes, and those are the ones we have focused on first, uh, meaning the code of civil procedure, the code of criminal procedure, as well as the code of administrative procedure. And the key question you might ask is, why do we task ourselves with doing this? And if you look at this map, uh, if you disregard Ireland and the United Kingdom, where obviously the legislation is in English already, if you disregard Sweden, which is uh, has Nordic law, which is a subset of civil law, and if you disregard Cyprus, which has a mixed system of civil and common law, every other country you see here in blue on the map has at least one procedural code available in English, often more. This includes countries with a smaller population, such as Iceland and Malta, but the, which are also languages of lesser diffusion. And there are very few exceptions in red that you can see have no procedural codes available online in English. Those are Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Luxembourg, Hungary, and unfortunately, Greece. Um, you can imagine what this means for uh, the rule of law or what uh, this entails for foreigners, such as myself living in Greece, who want to be apprised of their rights and obligations. And none of this is available in lingua franca of an era. Uh, so what is the importance of procedural law and why did we focus on it first? Uh, as Judge Selman has said, substantive law is concerned with the ends which uh, the administration of justice seeks, whereas procedural law deals with the means and instruments by which these ends are to be attained. So the means and instruments are very important to us and we see that in translating the procedural codes, there's extensive use of terms throughout them. There are key terms that are encountered in all three procedural codes, so there is a need for consistency across them. And there is a lot of cross-referencing between the codes. For example, what happens when a criminal issue arises during civil proceedings. Conversely, what happens when a civil issue arises during criminal proceedings and so forth. And the codes are interconnected. There's a lot of referencing from one to the other. So. Uh, what do we do? How do we find the terminology and consolidate it and fix it, especially considering that we're translating from Greek, as you can see, a country in blue, a, a country of civil law, into English, which is normally spoken in countries uh, of common law, United States, Australia, Canada, and so forth. Can we rely on existing translations of the Greek civil code and the Greek penal code? These are the 1982 translation of the civil code the 1973 translation of the Penal Code, and the much more recent 2017 translation of the Penal Code? Uh, our answer is, broadly speaking, probably not. Uh, there are various terminological issues that these translations contain. 
And mostly they're inconsistent. They, be, they were translated by different persons at different points in time. And they're also obsolete. For example, the 1973 Penal Code discusses the death penalty and offenses against the king. Greece obviously no longer has either a monarchy or the death penalty. So it's obsolete, the translation. Secondly, changes to the legal system. Uh, there's a propensity of the Greek legislature to frequently amend the, all the codes. Even the Code of Civil of Criminal Procedure we have published in 2022, last year, it's been amended more than 10 times since. Um, the translations don't have the source text, so it's not easy to compare between the Greek and the English. Even if uh, there it was there, uh, it's changed so much in the decades. They use pretty antiquated terminology, and there is no glossary or glossaries more than one in either direction of languages. And there's no introduction setting out their translational approach or the issues they encountered, terminological or otherwise. Can we rely on bilingual legal dictionaries? They also present a number of terminological issues. Often they just provide terms without context. There are either too few or too many renderings uh, for a, a given term. They contain a few incorrect lemas. And again, um, they're quite obsolete and also they're out of print, several of the older ones. Uh, here's an example of uh, what I just said in the previous slide. The word etima, for example, uh, in Hyotakis, there are too many uh, renderings. In Khandrinos and Anaki, too few renderings. So it's a bit of a Goldilocks situation. Uh, the reader doesn't know which term to use given uh, the specific context. On the other hand, telesidiki apophasy is rendered in all four as final, whether judgment, decision, uh, etc. We consider this an incorrect lima because it does not differentiate between the concept of oristiki apophasy, uh, telesidiki apophasy. And there's a difference. One is uh, the, fire, the uh, judgment ending proceedings, but still open to legal remedies, whereas telesidiki apophasy is not open to all the legal remedies. And there's also amitakiti, obviously. How about specifically procedural terminology issues in dictionaries? Uh, just one example to save time. Uh, we only see Hyotakis uh, dealing with the terms ekphonisi and thinokolisi, which are used throughout all three procedural codes. The other three dictionaries we consulted uh, did not include these terms. So what was the solution uh, for us to translate all the codes from scratch and uh, ab nihilo and to look at every single code, how it interacts with all the others before coming up with a translational solution in a glossary? Uh, in this process, we encountered a lot of common terminological issues which are presented in the paper John and I wrote. Um, firstly, there is polysemy of terms where uh, one term can have several different meanings within the same code. Secondly, polysemy again, but uh, where a single term can have a different meaning in a different context, usually a different legal setting. And thirdly, the, it, the reverse of this, elegant variation, where a lot of terms are used when they only have one rendering. Uh, examples, polysemy of, uh, within the Code of Civil of Criminal Procedure. Categorumenos, uh, an accused person before the judgment, uh, before uh, the Judicial Council has decided to commit the case to trial. Defendant after they have been committed to trial. Crisi can mean a number of different things. It can be either a court's ruling on a matter, but it can also be a person's determination, opinion, view, judgment, or it forms part of the stock phrase at one's discretion. Ikios, used as an adjective, uh, can mean competent or local, or, but where one uses a noun, it means uh, kin or relative. In the Code of Civil Procedure, um, th again, these are just uh, minor examples. Apophasy could be a judgment ending the proceedings, or it could just be a ruling on a specific issue that arose during the proceedings, which is resolved and the proceedings continue. Eteria, when it's a nonprofit uh, association under civil laws association, but when it's a commercial enterprise, Company is the more appropriate term. In the Code of Administrative Procedure, organo, uh, it can either mean a collective body, an institution, or it can mean a single officer or official of that institution. And it's important to distinguish between the two. Praxi can mean an act, act or remission, uh, or it can mean a document, it can mean a notarial instrument or deed prepared by a notary public, or it could mean a decision issued by a body. Uh, polysemy of context, where one uh, term means one thing in one legal setting and another in a different legal setting. For the instance, kataskisi. In a criminal setting, the more appropriate term would be seizure. 
in uh, a civil law set, in civil setting, uh, attachment is used more often. However, when we're talking about katastasis uh, aeroscapus and scapus, the established term is arrest. Why? Because that's the term used in the international conventions and treaties ratified by Greece. And again, in administrative law, attachment is used again. Enohi, guilt, obviously, in a criminal setting, but when used in the civil uh, setting and the administrative setting, it's usually obligations. Um, but there's also an instance in the administrative code of uh, it being used in both senses, and we have to distinguish between the two in our glossaries. Anastoli, in all three, it can mean suspension of a deadline uh, or a sentence, or it can mean a stay of proceedings and something else. So we have to differentiate between them in every uh, separate tone. Elgin variation, uh, where we have several terms used in the Greek to denote more or less the same concept. Therefore, we use a single term in English. It's always institution of proceedings. It's always the victim. It's always the evidence. These are just different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, examples from the Code of Civil Procedure. Pragmatica gegonota peristatica, actual facts. Perivalete periaptete calipti ton tipo, takes the form of. Again, these are pretty obvious because as laws are amended over time, it's not the same people writing them and language changes over time. So that accounts for the differences in the Greek. But in the English, to have a utilitarian uh, final text, we need to pick a single term. And the, the administrative uh, code, this was quite interesting. Within the context of a single article, we saw the same uh, different terms used with the same meaning. In Article 42 of the Code of Administrative Procedure, all mean disciplinary proceedings in that context. In the context of Article 183, simply mean confidentiality. It doesn't involve duty of secrecy. The is obviously in Article 46, the same thing, court costs. And it begs the question, why didn't the leg legislator choose a single term? So we have identified several problems in the source text through the process of translation. And we have a foreword in all of our books where we explain the issues that we encountered. We underline the errors in the source text, whether these are typos, spelling errors, uh, referencing errors, and so forth. And we explain the interventionist approach we took to the translation. Uh, this includes explicitation, which I'll discuss in a minute. Gender neutral language and English is uh, quite useful in that respect. It's much easier to achieve a gender neutral language in English than in Greek. Simplified language, we avoided Latin terms wherever possible, and we consolidated terminology both vertically within each code and horizontally across all our codes. So, what is the goal? To achieve consistency above all else, like Mr. Roche said, in any system, you need to have consistency to serve as a reference point for legal translation from Greek into English, and to serve as a springboard for legal scholarship, both in terms of comparative law and in terms of lexicography. Uh, what does our approach entail specifically? We have a bi bilingual lay layout, as you can see, with the Greek on the left and the English on the right. Uh, this allows for ease of comparison. You can see the Greek text and you can see the exact corresponding English text and compare them immediately. Uh, we use explicitation brackets uh, in the English text for three reasons, to highlight context, which is missing from the Greek, to explain acronyms, and to highlight errors in the Greek text. As an example, in the very first article of the Code of Criminal Procedure, there is an error. It says law 4193. The actual number is 4139, and we have included that in explicitation brackets. The other one is the series of the Government Gazette, EOV. It's a really long uh, acronym in English, but we prefer to have a whole acronym uh, ready for the reader rather than create an arbitrary table of acronyms and have uh, the reader consult them every few pages. Uh, in our, our forewords, we explain the translational approach we took and we highlight the issues we encountered. Here you can see the excerpts on the issues I noted in the presentation, polysemic terms or ambiguous language, and elegant variation and euphemisms. We also have glossaries in all our books. Uh, we have three columns, source language, target language, and a third one with notes. Uh, obviously, the Greek is the Greek, the English is the English, and the notes refer the reader either to a specific article to see the difference between the usage, 
or they refer them to the introduction where they can where we discuss why we chose a different term in much more detail. And thirdly, there is cross-referencing. Uh, rather than uh, when all the codes are published, rather than have uh, the reader consult the back to the same code or the introduction, we might refer to see Article 44 of the Civil Code, see Article 55 of the Code of Administrative Procedure, and so forth. So it's a two-way glossary. All our books have both Greek to English and English to Greek. They're contextual. They provide information in the notes. And they're quite extensive. Just the Code of Criminal Procedure, the, there are more than 1,300 limas in either direction. Uh, our publications to date include the Code of Criminal Procedure and the recently enacted Code of Private Maritime Law. And by the end of the year, we hope to have published the Code of Civil Procedure. And then we will move on to the Code of Administrative Procedure, the last uh, Code of Procedural Law in Greece we haven't translated. And we will focus on substantive law, civil code and penal code. The translations, all five are already complete. We're in the editing stage of the final three. Uh, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ για την πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρουσα παρουσίαση. Δεν μπορώ να μην πω ότι είναι καταπληκτικές οι δουλειές αυτές. Τις γνωρίζω και ο ίδιος. Ε, περιμέναμε οι νομικοί, ας πούμε, χρόνια να βγουν τέτοιες δουλειές. Σας θέλω ευχαριστώ. να πω συγχαρητήρια με την ευκαιρία αυτής της παρουσίασης. Και χωρίς να θέλω να καταχάρω στον χρόνο, να σημειώσω μόνο εμάς μας κάνει εντύπωση το γιατί δεν είχαν γίνει τόσες δεκαετίες. Ακριβώς, γιατί δεν είχαν γίνει τόσες δεκαετίες. Ακριβώς. Σας ευχαριστώ. Εμείς ευχαριστούμε. Ε, η επόμενη παρουσίαση έχει τίτλο Hybrid in the 21st Century της Σταματίας Σοφίου και της Ελίζαβεθ, Ελισάβετ Χατζιόλου. Η Σταματία Σοφίου είναι αναπληρώτρια καθηγήτρια γαλλικής γλώσσας και φιλολογίας της Στρατιωτικής Σχολή Ευελπίδων, όπου είναι υπεύθυνη συντονίστρια του τομέα των ξένων γλωσσών και διδάσκει γαλλική γλώσσα, λογοτεχνία και πολιτισμό, στρατιωτική ορολογία και φρασιολογία. Τα ερευνητικά της ενδιαφέροντα επικεντρώνονται στη, λογοτεχνη... στη διδακτική της γαλλικής ως ξένης γλώσσας, στην εφαρμοσμένη γλωσσολογία, στη στρατιωτική ορολογία. Ε, η Ελισάβετ Χατζιόλου είναι αναπληρώτρια καθηγήτρια αγγλικής γλώσσας, αγγλικής στρατιωτικής ορολογίας και αμερικανικής πολεμικής πεζογραφίας στη Στρατιωτική Σχολή Ευελπίδων. Έχει συγγράψει βιβλία για την εκμάθηση της αγγλικής γλώσσας, της αγγλικής στρατιωτικής ορολογίας και της αμερικανικής πολεμικής πεζογραφίας, που εκδίδονται και διδάσκονται στη Στρατιωτική Σχολή Ευελπίδων. Είναι επίσης μεταφράστρια αγγλικών και ελληνικών επιστημονικών και λογοτεχνικών βιβλίων. Ο λόγος εσά. Λοιπόν, μ' ακούτε, κύριε Κρυμπά. Ναι, σας ακούω, κύριε Χατζιόλου. Ο λόγος σε εσάς. Ωραία, ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ε, το σημερινό θέμα είναι το υβρίδιο στον 21ο αιώνα. Ε, η λέξη υβρίδιο προέρχεται από τη λατινική λέξη υβρίδα, η οποία σημαίνει γόνος διασταύρωσης διαφορετικών φυτών και ζώων και από την ελληνική λέξη ύβρις, η οποία αναφέρεται σε απογόνους διαφορετικών φυλών με δυνατότητες οι οποίες προμηνύουν καλές προοπτικές. Ο ημίωνος που φαίνεται στην εικόνα 1 είναι ένα βρίδιο, μια διασταύρωση ενός ανθεκτικού όνου. Συγγνώμη, δεν βλέπουμε τις εικόνες σας, δεν βλέπουμε τις εικόνες σας. Ναι. Τώρα... Το βλέπετε? Όχι. Άνοιξε το Πρέπει να διαμεραστείτε την οθόνη σας για να μπορέσουμε να το παρουσιάσουμε. Δεν βλέπουμε κάτι, δεν βλέπουμε κάτι. Τώρα το βλέπετε. Ε, φαίνεται ότι θα ξεκινήσει. Ναι, άρχισε. Το βλέπουμε. Το βλέπουμε. Εντάξει. Λοιπόν, ο τίτλος λοιπόν είναι το υβρίδιο στον 21ο αιώνα. Ε, η 
Λοιπόν, η λέξη βρύδιο προέρχεται από τη λατινική λέξη βρύδα, η οποία σημαίνει γόνος διασταύρωσης διαφορετικών φυτών και ζώων και από την ελληνική λέξη ύβρις, η οποία αναφέρεται σε απογόνους διαφορετικών φυλών με δυνατότητες οι οποίες προμηνύουν καλές προοπτικές. Ο ημίωνος στην εικόνα 1 είναι η βρύδιο, μια διασταύρωση ενός ανθεκτικού όνου και μιας ζεύρας και η Μανόλια Μπέτη στην εικόνα 2 είναι ένα άλλο υβρίδιο, μια διασταύρωση μια άσπρη και μια φούξια Μανόλια με σκοπό την παραγωγή ενό φυτού με κόκκινα λουλούδια και με αντοχή στο κρύο και στι ασθένειε. Η λέξη υβρίδιο είναι ουσιαστικό και χρησιμοποιείται σε πολλέ επιστήμε, όπω τη βοτανική, στην οποία η λεμονιά Μάιερ. Είναι μια διασταύρωση λεμονιού και μανταρινιού χωρίς ακάθια, πιο γλυκιά από το λεμόνι και αμυροδάτη όπως το μανταρίνι. Στη ζωολογία υπάρχουν άγρια ζώα όπως ο τζάγκλιον, ο απόγονος των ζωσενικού ιαουάρου και μιας λένας και ο κόιγουλφ, η διασταύρωση ενός κογιώτ και ενός λίγου. Υβριδικός, το επίθετο της λέξης υβρίδιο είναι το μέρος του λόγου το οποίο δείχνει ένα χαρακτηριστικό μια ιδιότητα και μια ποιότητα του ουσιαστικού το οποίο προσδιορίζει. Στη φυσική, τα υβριδικά ενεργειακά συστήματα είναι συνδυασμοί διαφορετικών στοιχείων όπως τα φωτοβολταϊκά και τα υδροηλεκτρικά συστήματα για να αξιοποιούνται τα γεωγραφικά πλεονεκτήματα μιας περιοχής. Τα υβριδικά συστήματα ισχύω συνδυάζουν μορφές ενέργειας για να τροφοδοτούν συνεχώς ένα σύστημα ε, με σταθερή τάση, ελεγχιστοποιώντας τους κινδύνους διακοπής της τροφοδοσίας. Είναι σχεδιασμένα να εναλλάσσονται με διαθέσιμες πηγές ενέργειας και να συνδυάζονται ταυτόχρονα ώστε να εξαρτώνται ελάχιστα από τις μεταβολές εξωγενών παραγόντων όπως η γεωφάνεια, η ένταση του ανέμου και η ροή του νερού. Σε άλλη επιστήμη, στην αρχιτεκτονική, ένα κτίσμα το οποίο έχει δύο ή περισσότερα διαφορετικά αρχιτεκτονικά στοιχεία ή δύο ή περισσότερους αρχιτεκτονικούς ρυθμούς ονομάζεται υβριδικό κτίσμα. Συγγνώμη, όπως... συγγνώμη για την διακοπή. Δεν έχουμε ούτε εικόνα ή αν κάνετε μοίρασμα οθόνη πάλι δεν φαίνεται. Όχι, Γιώργο, φαίνεται κανονικά. Κάτι συμβαίνει σε σένα. Συγγνώμη, οκ. Okay. Ε, σε, σε άλλη επιστήμη, στην αρχιτεκτονική, ένα κτίσμα το οποίο έχει δύο ή περισσότερα διαφορετικά αρχιτεκτονικά στοιχεία ή δύο ή περισσότερους αρχιτεκτονικούς ρυθμούς ονομάζεται υβριτικό κτίσμα, όπως μια παραδοσιακή νησιώτικη κατοικία, η οποία έχει στοιχεία σύγχρονης αρχιτεκτονικής έκφρασης. Τα υβριτικά συστήματα ισχύω συνδυάζουν με μορφές ενέργειας για να τροφοδοτούν συνεχώς ένα σύστημα με σταθερή τάση, Ελαχιστοποιώντα του κινδύνου διακοπή τη τροφοδοσία. Είναι σχεδιασμένα να εναλλάσσονται με διαθέσιμε πηγέ ενέργεια και να συνδυάζονται ταυτόχρονα ώστε να εξαρτώνται ελάχιστα από τι μεταβολέ εξωγενών παραγόντων όπω η ηλιοφάνεια, η ένταση του ανέμου και η ροή του νερού. Σε άλλη επιστήμη. Στην, ε, α, το, το ξαναλέω τώρα. Λάθο έκανα. Ε, να πρέπει να προχωρήσω. Στη λογοτεχνία, το κείμενο το οποίο αναμειγνύει ετερογενή στοιχεία ονομάζεται λογοτεχνικό υβρίδιο. Το βραβευμένο με Πούλιτζερ βιβλίο του Αμερικανού συγγραφέα Νόρμαν Μέιλερ, η στρατιά τη νύχτα, είναι ένα μη μυθοπλαστικό βιβλίο. Είναι μια ιστορία για πραγματικά γεγονότα και για πραγματικού ανθρώπου, την οποία ο συγγραφέα αφηγείται με την τεχνική και το δραματικό ύφος του μυθιστορήματος ε, και χαρακτηρίζεται από μια υπο, υποκειμονική ε, οπτική. Ε, στη βιολογία υπάρχουν τα υβριδικά κύτταρα ανθρώπου και ποντικού. Τα ανθρώπινα εγκεφαλικά κύτταρα εγχαίονται σε ποντίκια, τα οποία με τους υβριδικούς εγκεφάλους, τους οποίους αποκτούν, ε, αποδεικνύονται χρήσιμα για τη μελέτη νευρολογικών γεταραχών, όπως η σχιζοφρένεια, και για τις δοκιμές νέων θεραπείων για νόσους όπως η πολλαπλή σκύρινση.
Στη βιολογία, οι υβριδικοί οργανισμοί είναι συμβατοί και μπορούν να αναπαραχθούν, αν και πολλές φορές είναι στήροι. Σε παραγωγή υβριδικών φυτών είναι δυνατόν να παράγεται πλήθος αρένων στήρων φυτών, τα οποία δεν παράγουν γύρι τα ίδια. Τα φυτά και τα ζώα, τα οποία προκύπτουν από τη διασταύρωση δύο διαφορετικών ποικιλιών ενός είδου παρουσιάζουν βελτιωμένα χαρακτηριστικά σε σχέση με τους γονείς τους, όπως είναι η αύξηση μεγέθους, η ανθεκτικότητα στις ασθένειες και στα ακραία καιρικά φαινόμενα. Στη γλωσσολογία, ο όρος βίβλιο χρησιμοποιείται για να περιγράψει νέες τάσεις. Έτσι, η μουσική jungle είναι ένα μείγμα μουσικής disco, jazz και soul, η οποία χαρακτηρίζεται από ένα δυνατό επαναλαμβανόμενο ρυθμό. Στην καθομιλουμένη, η φράση «Υβριδική ταυτότητα» αφορά το μετανάστη, ο οποίος ήρθε στην Ελλάδα για να βρει εργασία, αλλά ενώ διατηρεί την ταυτότητα της πατρίδας του, ζητά να αποκτήσει και την ταυτότητα της χώρας υποδοχής. Στην κοινωνιολογία, η φράση «Υβριδικές ε, κοινωνίες» ε, αναφέρεται στις κοινωνίες των λόγων της Αυστραλίας, των ΗΠΑ του Καναδά, και άλλων χωρών, των οποίων τα μέλη αποτελούνται από μετανάστες, οι οποίοι προέρχονται από διαφορετικές φυλές και από διαφορετικούς πολιτισμούς. Να σας διακόψω για ελάχιστα, παρακαλώ. Ναι. Ε, απλώς θέτω υπόψη σας ότι μέχρι τις 12.30 πρέπει να τελειώσουμε, έτσι, οπότε ναι, 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 ναι. Ε, εσείς φροντίζετε δε όντως. Ευχαριστώ Βέβαια. πολύ. Στις χώρες αυτές, η πολιτιστική πολυμορφία των μεταναστών δημιούργησε νέες μορφές πολιτιστικής έκφρασης με τη βοήθεια της εκπαίδευσης και της τεχνολογίας, όπως είναι η αμοιβαία γνώση των πολιτισμών των λαών και η αξιοποίηση της πολυγλωσίας. Η αξιοποίηση της τεχνολογίας δημιούργησε την υβριδική μάθηση, η οποία βοήθησε στην εκπαίδευση και στην απασχόληση του εργατικού δυναμικού κατά τη διάρκεια της πανδημίας, όταν με την υβριδική εργασία δημιουργήθηκαν οι προοπτικές για τους εργαζόμενους να έχουν πρόσβαση στη διεθνή αγορά εργασίας χωρίς να χρειάζεται να εγκαταλείψουν την πατρίδα τους. Ε... Σχετικά με τους ανθρώπους, ο όρος υβρίδι αναφέρεται σε μια οντότητα η οποία περιλαμβάνει ανθρώπινα στοιχεία αλλά και μη ανθρώπινο γενετικό υλικό. Η οντότητα της οποίας μερικά κύτταρα που έρχονται από άνθρωπο και μερικά από ένα διαφορετικό οργανισμό ονομάζεται χήμερα. Η πρόταση, η παγκόσμια εξάλληψη της πείνας και του υποσυτισμού είναι μια χήμερα, αναφέρεται σε μια μη ρεαλιστική ιδέα. Και η ελληνική έκφραση κυνηγά χήμερα σημαίνει ότι Κάποιο επιδιώκει κάτι το οποίο δεν είναι εφικτό. Ο όρος ανθρώπινο ζωικό υβρίδιο αναφέρεται σε μια οντότητα η οποία ενσωματώνει στοιχεία από ανθρώπινους και μη ανθρώπινους οργανισμούς. Ε, σε ένα τέτοιο υβρίδιο κάθε κύτταρο έχει ανθρώπινο και μη ανθρώπινο γενετικό υλικό, όπως τα ποντίκια των οποίων οι υβριδικοί εγκέφαλοι χρησιμεύουν στις μελέτες της ιατρικής. Σε μια υβριδική ανθρώπινη ζωική κατάσταση, μια οντότητα μπορεί να έχει μερικά ανθρώπινα κύτταρα και μερικά κύτταρα τα οποία προέρχονται από ένα διαφορετικό οργανισμό. Η οντότητα αυτή ονομάζεται ανθρώπινη ζωική χήμερα. Έχει γενετικά διαφορετικούς ιστούς και υπάρχει στα κινούμενα σχέδια. Στις εικόνες 3 και 4 φαίνονται οι half-human, half-viltrumite men, μια ράτσα πλανήτη κατακτητών από το φανταστικό πλανήτη Βέλτρουμ. Στην αυτοκινητοβιομηχανία η λέξη βρίδιο χρησιμοποιείται στην τεχνολογία για να περιγράψει το υβριδικό αυτοκίνητο το οποίο αξιοποιεί δύο υπερσόδες διαφορετικές ε, τεχνολογίες για την κίνησή του. Οι τεχνολογίες αυτές περιλαμβάνουν τον κλασικό κινητήρα εσωτερική κάψη και μία ήπια ως προς το περιβάλλον τεχνολογία, όπως έναν ηλεκτρικό κινητήρα, για να, μειών, να, για να μειώνονται οι κατανάλωση αρκετών καυσίμων και ρήπη. Τα υβριδικά ηλεκτρικά οχήματα, plug-in, διαθέτουν όλες τις λειτουργίες της υβριδικής τεχνολογίας και φορτίζονται από μια παροχή ηλεκτρικού ρεύματος, με πλήρως φορτισμένη την μπαταρία και οδηγώντα μόνο με τον ηλεκτροκινητήρα 
Ένα όχημα που μπορεί να διανύσει μια απόσταση μέχρι και 55 χιλιόμετρα ανάλογα με το μέγεθος της μπαταρίας. Κατασκευάζοντας υβριδικά οχήματα, μειώνουμε τις περιβαλλοντικές επιπτώσεις κατά τις μετακινήσεις μας ή κατά τις μεταφορές προϊόντων σε μεγάλες αποστάσεις. Οι λέξεις υβρίδιο και υβριδικός χρησιμοποιούνται και στο στρατό. Ο όρος υβριδικός πόλεμος εμφανίστηκε το 2000 για να ορίσει έναν πόλεμο ο οποίος διεξάγεται με τη χρήση συμβατής και μη συμβατής συμβατικής και μη συμβατικής τακτικής. Ε, στις επιχειρήσεις του Ιβρετικού Πολέμου επικρατεί συνεργασία τακτικού και άτακτου στρατού, ο κυβερνοπόλεμος, τρομοκρατία, ο ανταρτοπόλεμος, η παραπληροφόρηση, η χρήση φθηνής τεχνολογίας και η χρήση μη φωνικών μέσων, όπως ο οικονομικός πόλεμος, η προπαγάνδα, ο ψυχολογικός πόλεμος και η λειτουργία λογαριασμών στα μέσα κοινωνικής δικτύωσης. Οι συντελεστέ του υβριδικού πολέμου συνυπάρχουν στη δράση. Έτσι, μια κυβερνοεπίθεση συνήθως λαμβάνει η χώρα πριν από μια στρατιωτική επίθεση. Πόλεμοι αυτού του είδους είναι οι επιθέσεις της Χες Μπολάχ κατά του Ισραήλ στα σύνορα με το Λίβανο το 2006, σύγκρουση Ισραήλ και Χαμάς στη Λορίζα της Γάζας το 2008, η επέμβαση της Ρωσίας στη Γεωργία το 2008 και η προσάρτηση της Κρυμαίας από τη Ρωσία το 2014. Οι υβριδικές απειλέ δύσκολα να γνωρίζονται πριν να εκδηλωθούν, ε, εκδηλωθούν πλήρω οι επιβλαβέ επιπτώσει του. Σκοπό έχουν να μειώσουν την ικανότητα του στόχου να υπερασπιστεί έγκαιρα τον εαυτό του. Δεν καθορίζονται μόνο από τα κράτη, αλλά και από πυρεξούσει, οι οποίοι προσπαθούν να επιφέρουν κυβερνητικέ αλλαγέ και οικονομικέ καταστροφέ και να λιώσουν την αντίληψη του λαού. Η υβριδική εκστρατεία έχει σοβαρέ επιπτώσει όπω την αλλαγή πολιτικών και κυβερνητικών αποφάσεων, την κοινωνική ή οικονομική καταστροφή και τι ανθρώπινε απώλειε. Κατά τι υβριδικέ εκστρατείε των Τούρκων στα χερσαία σύνορα τη Ελλάδα, οι διακινητέ παράτυπων μεταναστών σε συνεργασία με την τουρκική στράτο χώρο φυλακή οδήγησαν ομάδε παράνομων μεταναστών προ τα ελληνικά σύνορα, αναζητώντα τρόπου να προκαλέσουν ένα θερμό επεισόδιο. Στι συνδετικέ συγκρούσει εμπλέκονται στρατιωτικέ δυνάμει χωρί εμφανή ταυτότητα, όπω οργανώσει εξτρεμιστών, το Ισλαμικό κράτο, μη κρατικέ οργανώσει ή χεσμολά, με σκοπό τη δημιουργία βεβαιότητα και την πρόκληση προβλημάτων στην αλυσίδα λήψη αποφάσεων. Στην ε, υβριδική κατάρτιση. Ε, η μέθοδος εκπαίδευσης και διδακτικής των επιστημών εισάχθηκε στη διδακτική επιστήμη για να διευκολύνει το έργο καθηγητών σπουδαστών. Αφορά την παράλληλη συνύπαρξη εξ και διαζώσεις διδασκαλία, η οποία διεξάγεται με τη χρήση τεχνολογικών μέσων, τα οποία διευκολύνουν την ομαλή διεξαγωγή του μαθήματος και εξασφαλίζουν την αμφίδρομη άλλη επιδραστική διαδικασία. Η υβριδική εκπαίδευση καλύπτει τι διαφορετικέ ανάγκε οι οποίε προκύπτουν κατά τι εκπαιδευτικέ διαδικασίε. Εφαρμόζεται στην πρωτοβάθμια και στη δευτεροβάθμια εκπαίδευση, ενώ στο Πανεπιστήμιο διδάσκεται ω αυτόνομη επιστημονική ενότητα στα πλαίσια τη διδακτική των γλωσσών. Για τη, Για τη διεξαγωγή υβριδική εκπαίδευση χρησιμοποιούνται λογισμικά βίντεο διάσκεψη. Λογισμικά για τι μεταφραστικέ επιστήμε ή λογισμικά προσωμείωση ειδικών εργαστηριακών μαθημάτων, όπω είναι οι περιπτώσει προσωμείωση μια ιατρική επέμβαση. Κατά την υβριδική εκπαίδευση, ο καθηγητή διατηρεί τον πρωτογενικό ρόλο του, επειδή το υλικό του μαθήματο έχει προ... προετοιμαστεί από τον ίδιο, ακόμη και όταν το μάθημα τη ημέρα διεξάγεται μέσω πλατφόρμα σε συνθήκε ασύγχρονη εκπαίδευση, όπω η αυτοδιδασκαλία ή μια αυτόματη εκπαίδευση και η συνεργαζόμενη εκπαίδευση. Ε, στην υβριδική εκπαίδευση, ακόμα και αν ένα τμήμα μια σχολή εισάγεται στον χώρο του Πανεπιστημίου και διδάσκεται το μάθημα εξ αποστάσεως, οι φοιτητέ διδάσκονται με τη μέθοδο της υβριδική εκπαίδευση. Τα πλεονεκτήματα της υβριδική εκπαίδευση είναι η μείωση των δαπανών για τη συντήρηση των εκπαιδευτικών κτηρίων, η μείωση των δαπανών για τις μετακινήσεις καθηγητών σπουδαστών, η μείωση του χρόνου 
στις μετακινήσεις διδασκάλων δασκομμένων, αλλά και η παροχή ίσων ευκαιριών μάθησης για όλους τους εκπαιδευόμενους και η διευκόλυνση των σπουδαστών να παρακολουθήσουν το μάθημα από τον προσωπικό του χώρο όταν υπάρχουν λόγοι υγείας ή άλλοι σοβαροί λόγοι. Τέλος, η, η παρούσα ερευνά δείχνει ότι οι όροι υβρίδιο και υβριδικός χρησιμοποιούνται στις επιστήμες για να διευκολύνουν τη γραπτή και την προφορική επικοινωνία και τη συνεργασία ερευνητών, καθηγητών και σπουδαστών. Τα παραδείγματα τα οποία αναφέρονται εδώ δείχνουν ότι οι δύο αυτοί όροι καθιστούν τους επιστήμονες ικανούς να ανταλλάξουν αποτελεσματικά χρήσιμες πληροφορίε και απόψεις για την επιστήμη τους, να νιώσουν υπεύθυνοι κατά την επικοινωνία τους με συναδέλφου να έχουν περισσότερες δυνατότητες να εκφραστούν σωστά όσον αφορά τη χρήση των όρων και να αποκτήσουν γνώσεις και εμπειρίες με τη μορφή της συζήτησης και του διαλόγου στα διάφορα επιστημονικά φόρα. Ευχαριστώ. Κύριε Κρυπά, τελείωσα. Σα ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Η ώρα είναι 12.22. Καλύτερα δεν γινόταν. Σα ευχαριστούμε Εντάξει. πάρα πολύ. Και εγώ ευχαριστώ. Έχει πάρα πολύ ενδιαφέρον. Ε, ευχαριστώ. Δυστυχώς, ευχαριστώ. Ό, όπως γνωρίζετε, σε όλα τα συνέδρια συνήθως υπάρχει μια μικρή έτσι, καθυστέρηση και αναγκαστικά συγχαρητήρια. Ε, λοιπόν, τώρα Άστε, να, πω στους, να πω στους συνέδρους εδώ ότι όποιος που παρακολουθούν, ότι όποιος έχει κάποια ερώτηση μπορεί να τη βάλει στο chat. Έτσι, και εμείς... Στο chat, ναι. Ναι, θα το chat και θα, θα, πούμε, θα την αναφέρουμε και θα την αναγνώσουμε δηλαδή την ερώτηση πέραν του ότι θα τη δουν και οι ομιλητές στο chat. Ναι. Αν υπάρχει κάτι έχουμε 10 λεπτά για ερωτήσεις. Παναγιώτη έχω μια παρατήρηση. Άννα, βεβαίω. Ναι. Κυρία Αναστασιάδη, ακούμε. Ναι. Να, αφού σα ευχαριστήσω για την ωραία παρουσίαση ε, και πλούσια παρουσίαση, θα ήθελα να κάνω μια μικρή παρατήρηση στη χρήση του όρου υβρίδιο στη γλωσσολογία. Νομίζω το διατρέξατε πάρα πολύ σύντομα. Τόσο σύντομα που δεν βγαίνει αποτέλεσμα. Γιατί ε, στο σημείο που μιλήσατε για τη γλωσσολογία, Αμέσω μετά, πριν δώσετε κάποιο παράδειγμα για να γίνει σαφέ τι εννοείται στη γλωσσολογία με το υβρίδιο, ε, περάσατε στη μουσική. Και έτσι δίνετε εντύπωση του λάθο. Ε, μάλλον θα πρέπει το σημείο που αναφέρεστε στη γλωσσολογία λίγο να το, αυξήσ... να το, να το αυξήσετε, δίνοντα κάποιο παράδειγμα. Ε, ε, το υβρίδιο και στη γλωσσολογία σημαίνει κάτι το μεικτό και αφορά κυρίω θέματα ετοιμολογία. Όχι εδώ, ε, ότι λέτε ότι είναι ουσιαστικό, πιο κάτω. Εκεί που αναφέρεστε, στη... είναι πάνω πάνω σε μια διαφάνεια. Στον πρόλογο. Όχι, όχι. Λέξη... πιο μετά, πιο μετά, μετά, μετά. Μετά από κάποιες διαφάνειες, προχωρήστε αν θέλετε ακόμα λίγο. Πιο κάτω, πιο κάτω. Ναι, ναι. Πιο κάτω. Ε... Πιο κάτω. Πιο κάτω. Στη... Εδώ, ε, εδώ. εδώ, στη γλωσσολογία ο όρος ευρύδιο χρησιμοποιείται για να περιγράψει νέες τάσεις. Ναι, αυτό δεν λέει τίποτε. Εγώ το ξέρω το υβρίδιο ω όρο που χρησιμοποιείται στον χώρο της ετοιμολογίας όταν μια λέξη μέσα σε μια ενότητα, δηλαδή όπως είναι μια λέξη, υπάρχουν ε, στοιχεία, ε, δύο τουλάχιστον, που είναι από διαφορετική προέλευση. Δηλαδή, παράδειγμα, ναι. η τελευρίζον στα αγγλικά, είναι το τι λέει από τα ελληνικά και το βίζον από τα λατινικά. Ή στα ναι. ελληνικά η λέξη αυτό γκολ, το αυτό είναι από το ελληνικό και το γκολ είναι από τα αγγλικά. Α, ναι. α, η, η διπλή Ο, ετοιμολόγηση... ποιο, ποιο είναι το πρόβλημα σας εδώ που λέει η μουσική jungle. Όχι, εκεί περνάτε στη μουσική ε, και στη γλωσσολογία δεν δίνεται κάποιο παράδειγμα και δεν είναι νέε τάσει που περιγράφονται, αλλά είναι η διπλή, ε, η, η διπλή προέλευση τον ετοιμολογικά για μία λέξη. Ναι, βγαίνει μία τάση και μετά φτιάχνει, δημιουργείται όρος. Δηλαδή, αυτή η μουσική η οποία περιέχει Δεν όλα αυτά... Δεν μιλάμε μουσική στη γλωσσολογία. Μα έχουμε έναν... Ε, στη γλωσσολογία δεν μιλάτε για λέξεις. Εγώ δεν είμαι γλωσσολόγος. Ναι, ναι. Δεν... Στη γλωσσολογία μιλάμε για λέξεις και μετά... Ε, ναι. Εσείς τώρα, η μίξη που κάνετε εδώ... Ναι. Αφορά το αντικείμενο αναφοράς. Ναι. Το, δεν είναι αυτό. Το υβρίδιο χρησιμοποιείται στη, διαφο, 
στην ποικιλία, στην ετοιμολόγηση, όχι στο αντικείμενο αναφορά. Ναι. Το αυτοκόνο ναι. αντικείμενο αναφορά ή η τηλεόραση είναι ίδιο παντού σε όλο τον κόσμο. Δεν μιλάμε για, το, για τα χαρακτηριστικά του αντικειμένου που θα το χρησιμοποιούσαμε στην κατηγοριοποίηση οντολογιών κλπ. Εδώ ναι, πρόκειται ναι, ναι. για την ετοιμολογία. Μπορεί να έχετε ε, δίκιο, γιατί εγώ δεν είμαι γλωσσολόγο. Ναι. Άρα το παράδειγμα που. Ε, που Με δίνει, το jungle. Τα αφαιρείτε ναι. όλα αυτά. Μπορείτε να προσθέσετε ω παράδειγμα ή το television για την αγγλική γλώσσα. Ναι. Στα ελληνικά τηλεόραση και τα δύο είναι από τα ελληνικά. Δεν υπάρχει. Ελληνικά, τίποτα. ναι. Ή στα το ελληνικά. Το τηλεόραση, για παράδειγμα. Ευχαριστώ. Να μην κρατώ το χρόνο. Και εγώ σα ευχαριστώ. Ναι. Έχουμε κάποια άλλη ερώτηση ή παρατήρηση. Δεν βλέπω κάτι. Αν δεν υπάρχει άλλη ερώτηση ή παρατήρηση, μπορούμε να κηρύξουμε τη λήξη αυτής της πρωινής συνεδρίας. Να κάνω μια ερώτηση, Παναγιώτη, πριν κλείσουμε. Βεβαίως. Η Αγγελική Φωτοπούλου είμαι. Ναι, Αγγελική, σε ακούμε. Ε, α, ε, η ερώτηση δεν είναι για το... Η ερώτηση είναι ε, περισσότερο ερωτήσεις στον κύριο Ρος. Θα κάνουμε μετά, θα τις γράψουμε. Πώς τώρα, θα... όχι όλα, για όλη την πρωινή συνεδρία τώρα. Δηλαδή, αυτό που όταν, όταν λέω ε, για ερωτήσεις, μιλάω για, γενικώ για όλη τη συνεδρία που προηγήθηκε. Αν ο κύριος Ρος δεν είναι εδώ αυτή τη στιγμή να τις απαντήσει, θα τις μαζέψουμε εμείς και θα του τις μεταφέρουμε. Ε, εάν δεν είναι εδώ, τότε να πω κάτι, μια παρατήρηση ελληνικά, άμα δεν είναι. Άμα είναι, μπορώ να το πω στα γαλλικά, όχι στα αγγλικά. Ναι, ε, να δω αν είναι, για μισό λεπτό εδώ, να δω. Δεν βλέπω να είναι. Εντάξει, ε, τότε, εντάξει για να μην χάνουμε Όχι, και εδώ, είναι, εδώ είναι, εδώ είναι, εδώ είναι. Είναι μέσα, είναι μέσα ο κύριος Ρος. Ε, 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 Μεσχε Ρος, bonjour. Να Αγγλή. ανοίξει το μικρόφωνο του και η εικόνα του κύριου. Ωραία. Okay, Monsieur Roche, bonjour, Angeliki Fotopoulou de l'Institut Linguistique de la Parole du Centre de Recherche Athéna. J'ai déjà travaillé avec, euh, avec euh, le système dont vous nous avez parlé et j'ai trouvé que la, euh, la définition des relations entre les concepts C'est un problème assez difficile, assez complexe. C'est-à-dire, essayer... Nous, on a fait un, disons, un dictionnaire sémantique et dans le cadre de protéger, en utilisant protéger, un dictionnaire sémantique. C'est vrai que c'était la, la, la langue générale, la langue, pas la terminologie, mais eh, on, on a remarqué que concernant les données linguistiques, c'est-à-dire les mots, les unités lexicales, il y avait une très... C'était très difficile pour arriver à relier les différents... Les, les différents... Les, les différents, comment dire... Trouver les relations sémantiques et lexicales entre les différentes données. C'est-à-dire, peut-être pour la terminologie, c'est plus facile parce qu'il s'agit des concepts, on gère des concepts, mais on a remarqué que ce n'était pas un outil, un système assez, eh, disons, assez pratique pour organiser des données linguistiques. Bon, c'est juste une remarque, peut-être c'est... Et ça n'a pas un rapport direct avec ce que vous faites, mais je me demande si vous avez trouvé des difficultés d'organiser, de, de hiérarchiser ce système concernant les, les, le côté linguistique des termes. Voilà. Merci pour ces questions. Euh, en fait, protéger n'est pas fait. Monsieur Ross, excusez-moi. Euh, je voudrais que Mme Calfadopoulou d'exprimer de, euh, de de la même question en bref, euh, en grec, s'il vous plaît. Bien sûr. Ah, ah, en grec, ok. Euh, il n'y a pas de protéger 
στα, κάνοντας ένα ε, νεολογικό λεξικό στο ΙΕΛ και είδαμε ένα γενικό όμως, όχι ε, ορολογικό και είδαμε ότι έχει, υπάρχει πολύ μεγάλη δυσκολία για να συνδέσεις τις διάφορες, δηλαδή όχι μόνο το γενικό με το ειδικό, αλλά να συνδέσεις τις διάφορες σχέσεις, τις γλωσσικές σχέσεις, με το συνώνυμο, αντώνυμο ε, και όλες τις άλλες σχέσεις που θέλεις να, να δηλώσεις σε αυτό το σύστημα, γιατί αυτό το σύστημα, κατά τη γνώμη μου, δεν είναι για, γλωσσο, γλω, για γλωσσικά δεδομένα. Χωρίς να, αυτό να απαξιώνω, γιατί έχουμε και εμείς δουλέψει πολύ σε αυτό, την, την αξία του. Και αν, αναρωτιόμουν αν στην ορολογία, που έχει βέβαια και την πλευρά, την conceptual, την ενιολογική περισσότερο, αν είχαν τέτοιου τύπου προβλήματα, δηλαδή την οργάνωση των, των σχέσεων στο εσωτερικό της οντολογίας. Αυτό. Ελπίζω να τα πάω και στα ελληνικά σωστά. Merci, monsieur Roche, si vous avez... Quelque chose à, à nous dire. Alors, uh, uh, I, I know quite well protégé because I, I use it since uh, more than 10 years mm. and I teach uh, protégé. Protégé is a very interesting uh, environment from a logical point of view mm -hmm. and for organizing individuals into classes. Mm. But for terminology, is not a suitable environment, not at all for several reasons. For the conceptual dimension, there is no concept, but only class. And there is no essential characteristics. So you have to translate this either as an individuals, but it's very, very complicated. So it's not a suitable language for the conceptual dimension. You have to switch from concept to class and to change your way of thinking. No essential characteristics, no concept, only classes and restriction of properties, which is very complicated if you have not a background in logic, very complicated. And for mm -hmm. the linguistic dimension, the linguistic dimension is either very simple, as you can see in, in this slide. I mean, uh, to consider labels uh, as, uh, or terms as labels stuck on classes. It's, it's too simple for doing that. Of course, it can be more complicated. I mean that, You, you can introduce individuals terms as individuals, not only as annotation. But in this case, it's also very complicated. I can explain, but I, I think I'm not sure that everybody is interested in to see how we can do that and using some, some uh, what we call punning. No, uh, protege is not done for terminology in other for linguistic, in linguistics. It's not a suitable language for that. The main problem is, in this case, which environment? I know, it's really a problem. But there is no clear solution, not good solutions, in fact. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not an environment for terminologists and linguists. Mm -hmm. Okay. Merci. Uh, Thank you very much for your uh, reply. And uh, uh, ο χρόνος μας έχει τελειώσει, ξεκινάει η μεσημεριανή συνεδρία. Σας ευχαριστούμε όλους όλες για τις ερωτήσεις και τα όποια σχόλια και ε, καλή συνέχεια στη, στο, στην, υπόλη, στην επόμενη συνεδρία. Γεια σας από μένα. Γεια yes. σας. Ε, ε, να πούμε βέβαια ότι υπενθυμίσουμε σε όλους ότι η επόμενη συνεδρία είναι στο WebEx πάλι. Ωραία. Ναι, γυρα, γυρίζουμε πάλι στο WebEx, έτσι, ναι. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Ross, for your interesting presentation. Thank you. If I was to Poli. Thank you very much, all the speakers, for your interesting and interesting presentations.